This is the day that the Lord hath made. A day of gratitude and generosity. This is the time God has given us. This is the life to which God calls us, a life of humility and service, a life of faith and trust. Loving God, in the company of your Son, our Lord, we may become enchanted with the light and glory of your goodness. Let us praise and serve you with deep delight. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.
Confession is about is God's invitation to repentance. And authentic repentance is, in turn, the key that opens the floodgates of forgiveness. Let us gladly accept the invitation to cleanse ourselves by confessing together the ways in which we have mismanaged God's gifts. Let us pray. Creator God, we confess this day to engaging in habits that diminish the bounty of your creation not satisfied with the goodness of your holy temple, your seas and mountains, your rain and soil. We have fashioned a system of sustenance that seems good to us, but cannot be sustained. Be merciful to us, for we have sinned. Answer us with awesome deeds of deliverance, O hope of the earth. Give us vision and a prophetic spirit. Renew our vocation as stewards of your creation. Amen. Give praise to God who accompanies us on our journey, who hears our cries and anguish, and who remains faithful and answers our prayers. Give glory to God who brings life out of death and joy out of sorrow. Thanks be to God. Having been made right with God through Jesus Christ, let us be made right with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please greet one another with signs of peace. Please be seated. I would ask you to please pass the pew pads and sign in if you haven't already. And children, you don't have to do that, just the adults. We'll let your parents all sign you in. That'll be easier. Um, I would bring to you word that Tanya 
Uh, Zahn had her surgery, her knee replacement on Tuesday, and it was successful. And she is at home recuperating, but she is having some fair amount of pain whenever she moves it. So um, we ask your prayers for her recovery. Also, I would uh, like to announce um, that because of trick-or-treating this Thursday night, going until 7.30, uh, Prayer in a Pipe is canceled for this week. Um, we'll be meeting again on November 10th for our next Prayer in a Pint. I don't have any other announcements to make to bring to your attention. Does anyone else have anything? In that case, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, make sure that you notice that the uh, women's conference is this weekend at T Free Church. Any other announcements? Then let us join our hearts and minds together. For caring for others is not for the weak minded, but for the strong. Let us pray. It is to our shared human shame, loving God, that there are people who are lost today, homeless and destitute today. Please aid victims and bring humanity to a new compassion and sense of fairness. It is to our human shame, loving God, that children are abused today, unfed, unclothed, and comfortless today. Please aid victims and bring humanity to a new intolerance of all abuse. It is to our human shame, loving God, that there are diseased folk without treatment today, injured people without doctors and nurses today. Please aid victims and bring humanity to a new intolerance of indifference. It is to our human shame, loving God, that some lives are being wasted today without employment and any realistic hope for work today. Please aid victims and bring humanity to a new passion for justice and mercy. It is to our churchly shame, loving God, that there are people who have never seen the gospel lived or brought to bear on their despair. Please aid victims. Bring your church to a new passion for the ways of Jesus. Merciful God, please enable all people, faith and love, to treasure and practice that love, which includes all who come asking for help and even searches for those who are too weary or despairing to ask. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, our most holy friend, 
Open our hearts. You are you are one source of peace and joy. Open our hearts, minds, and ears to hear what you have to say to us today. Amen. Reading from Joel. Later I will give my spirit to everyone. Our sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will see dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days I will even give my spirit to those who servants, to my servants, both men and women. I I will work wonders in the skies above, on the earth below. There will be blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will turn dark and the moon will be as red as blood. Before that great and terrible day I when I appear, then the Lord will Save everyone who faithfully, faithfully worships him. He has promised there will be, a, be servers, survivors on Mount Zion and, the, and in Jerusalem, and among them will be his chosen, cho- chosen ones. Psalm 65. Our God, you deserve praise in Zion, where we keep our promises to you. Everyone will come to you because you answer prayer. Our table sins get us down, but you forgive us. You bless our chosen ones, and you invite them to live near you in your temple. We will enjoy your house the sacred temple. Our God, you save us and your fearsome deeds answer, answer our, prayers, our prayers for justice. You give hope to people everywhere on earth, even those across the sea. You are strong and your mighty power put the mountains in place. You silence the roaring waves and the noisy shouts of the nations. People far away marvel at your fearsome deeds, and all who live under the sun celebrate and sing because of you. You take care of the earth and send rain to help the soil grow all kinds of crops. Your rivers never run dry, and you prepare the earth to produce much green. You water all of its fields and level the lumpy ground. You send showers of rain to soften the soil and help the plants sprout. Wherever your footsteps touch the earth, a rich harvest is gathered. Desert pastures blossom and mountains celebrate. Meadows are filled with sheep and goats. Valleys overflow overflow with grain and echo with joyful songs. And from the Gospel of Luke, in the 18th chapter, verses 9 through 14. Listen for God's word to you. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, 
thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
invite all the children to come down and join the other children who are here. We're going to sit over on this side today. Anybody else coming down? Good morning. How are you today? Good. You did a great job. Thank you so much for leading us in worship today with your music. That was wonderful. Um, I want to talk to you today about the parable that Jesus told. And we studied about it on Tuesday, if you were there. And it's a really important parable. Remember, the one man was praying in a big, loud voice. And he was praying all kinds of good things that he did, right? And the other man was praying in a very soft voice. And he was praying to God and said, I'm a bad person. I did a bad thing. And I want your mercy, God, your forgiveness. Now, when we start to be boastful, it's sort of like we've got a bunch of building blocks. Have you ever built a tower out of building blocks? Yeah? Sure, you've done that. And let's say I'm going to build a tower out of building blocks with all the good things that I've done. We'll pretend I have some here. And I'm going to say, I come to church every Sunday, and I'll put one block on. And I go to Sunday school on Sunday, and I'll put another block on. And I give money to the church in my offering, and I'll put another block on. And I do my work the way I'm supposed to, and I'll put another block on. And I make my bed in the morning. Do you do that? Yeah, no, okay. Here's another block. And I open the door for people when they're standing there and trying to come in. Another block, uh-oh, it's getting pretty tall. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Yes, Brock, you're right. And, and Josiah, you're both right. It's going to tip over pretty soon. Oh, I read the Bible regularly. Oh, oh, let me get this one on here on the top. There they go. Well, they toppled over because every time we try to build ourselves up, we're going to end up falling down. That's how it works in life. So the one man was trying to build himself up to God. He was trying to tell God what a great guy he is. All the good things he did, but he fell down. He went away just the same as he came. But the other man who was humble... He went away justified. He went away right with God in every way. And that's just a really important thing for us to remember in our lives, to be humble and not to be boastful about our good deeds. Just do the good deeds. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us and for giving us all things good. Help us to be more humble and to love you best. Amen. Thank you very much for coming to be with me, and you can go with Miss Pandy. Going up this way today. Okay. All right. There we go.
It's a busy musical morning today with the bells and the children. And with Tanya out with her knee replacement, I uh, am filling in for her on the bells, which is why I wasn't here downstairs to start worship. And I'll be uh, letting Tom do a part of the liturgy as well after the sermon so that I can get back up to the bell tower, choir, the balcony to uh, be able to play on the offertory. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What is there to say about this parable? It's so clear and so straightforward. It seems almost impossible to preach it sometimes. But is it? Because if we've learned anything from Luke, it's that nothing is the way it seems. The lowly are blessed, and the high-placed are rebuked. It's a case of reversals. What seems to be one thing is actually the reverse of it, and vice versa. From Mary's, going, Mary's song in the first chapter of the gospel to the very end where Jesus hangs on the cross and speaks to the thief, Luke is a gospel of reversals. The Pharisee is righteous according to the law. He doesn't lie about anything he says. He is blameless considering the words of the Torah. He fasts and gives alms, and he bears no resemblance to those characters he compares himself to. So where does he go wrong? It's the focus of his prayer. It's not on God, but focused on himself. You see, he's clear on the kind of life to live, but he's confused about the source of that life. He falls prey to thinking that all he has done, all that he himself is, is what's responsible for his goodness. And because he misses the source of his blessing, he despises those people God loves. Now, if we consider the tax collector, who also comes to pray, in contrast to the Pharisee, he stands way off, maybe even outside the temple gates. And once again, Luke plays with our expectations because the tax collector doesn't pray repentance for any particular thing. He doesn't promise to leave the tax collecting or to pay back and make restitution to those whom he's cheated. There's no pledge from him to lead a better life. He just throws himself on God's mercy acknowledging that his whole life is in God's hands, and he goes away justified by God, which he wasn't before. I once served in a church that had seminary interns, sort of student preachers, if you will, students from seminary who work 10 hours a week in various ways in the church learning more about being a pastor. A young woman had trained there for her first year and was returning for a second year at the same church. But that summer, she'd only been able to get part-time work, and she was struggling financially. She wasn't able to finish paying her bill off for the tuition the previous t term. She needed over $1,500 
in order to be able to start her fall term and continue her service at the church. And the session knew her pretty well at this point. She'd been there for a year every Sunday and teaching Sunday school class and helping with youth group, attending session meetings. And so they voted to give her the money so there wouldn't be any interruption in her schooling and her training. The session's vote was unanimous for the elders who were present that evening. But one elder was absent, and when she found out about it, she came to see me. And you can guess, she wasn't very pleased about the decision. She proceeded to tell me how her dad had died when she was only 11 and that she was working after school and weekends by the time she was 14 just to help make ends meet. It took her 12 long years after high school to earn her bachelor's degree a few classes a year while she worked full time in another position. Now in her 60s, she drove a nice new Buick, owned her home outright, and wore beautifully styled clothes and jewelry. She was incensed that we had given the student this money outright because no one had ever helped her. And she repeated that numerous times, no one ever helped me, she said. And I wanted to scream at her, no way! No way! Who does she think provided the job available to her at only 14? Who does she think had her working and living in a place that was near enough to a college with evening classes that she could attend while she worked full time? Who does she think provided secure long-term employment after college? Who does she think gave her the health and the determination, the stick-to-itiveness, the stoicness even, to stick out her long road through college. There was no room in her mind or her heart for God's part in all of this. There wasn't one thought of God helping her every day throughout her whole life. The elders who were present recognized the source of their blessings and chose to share it freely. The one elder could not see the source of her blessings, and so she despised the act of goodness and kindness and generosity toward the person that God loved. I believe our prayers are accurate indicators of how we view God in our lives. We may not pray as blatantly boasting as did the Pharisee, but who of us hasn't at least thought, there but for the grace of God go I? And that is the same thing, just in a very much milder form. David Loos writes on this passage, there's another trap in this parable as well, and that's to hear in the tax collector's confession an example that we ought to live our lives fully and entirely aware of our status as a sinner. But the minute you do that, you've also shifted attention away from God's activity to your status. And the trap is sprung one more time. Once again, it's not about you. Not about you being a sinner or a wretch or one who does not deserve to or merit God's grace or however you might want to formulate it. It's just not about you. It's about God. 
This parable was and is an attempt to shift our attention from ourselves, our piety or our passions, our faith or our failure, our glory or our shame, and shift it to God, the God who delights in justifying the ungodly, welcoming the outcast, and healing all who are in need. But how is it that we pray to God and manage to keep God the focus? First off, we can give thanks, not for what we have done, but for what God has done. Prayers like, thank you, God, for your love that I prayed with the children. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for good health. Thank you for steady work. These are the kinds of prayers that focus on God. And when we pray petitions, we can ask for God's mercy, for God's healing, for God's guidance, for God's patience or strength or whatever. We pray for God's mercy. We can pray for God's power to bring peace or God's love to bring about reconciliation. We can pray for most anything as long as we keep God first and foremost in it and not about me or even about them. But how God is caring for me or for them. David Lose continues, this is what makes this parable a trap. For as soon as we fall prey to the temptation to divide humanity into any kind of groups, any we and they, we have been aligned ourselves squarely with the Pharisee. Whether our division is between righteous and sinners, as with the Pharisee, or even between the self-righteous and the humble, as with Luke and the tax collector, we are doomed. Anytime you draw a line between who's in and who's out, this parable asserts, you will find God on the other side. Read this way, the parable ultimately escapes even its narrative setting and reveals that it is not about self-righteousness and humility any more than it is about a pious Pharisee and a desperate tax collector. Rather, this parable is about God, God who alone can judge the human heart, God who determines to justify the ungodly. God who alone can judge the human heart. God who chooses to justify the ungodly. God whom we can never understand, but simply love and thank and sometimes plead with. Friends, this parable and indeed all of our very lives is about God and God alone. To the glory of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia.
Would the congregation please be seated? Would you please join me in the affirmation of faith? We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the unity of communion of saints of the entire human family, and we believe that this unity of people of God must be manifest and active in that we love one another, that we give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another, that we share one baptism together, that we eat of one bread and drink of one cup together, that we confess one name, one Lord, for one cause, with one hope, which is the height and the breadth and the depth and the love of Christ forever and ever. Amen. The invitation to the offering. We come together to be restored and renewed and to bring our offerings for the advancement of the Lord's kingdom. Let us offer our gifts to God with gratitude and praise.
dedication. Whatever challenges we face, O oh God, we have also known your many blessings. Thrashing floors full of grain. So, that they may bring spirit and to share our true spirit. Share in the bounty with those in need. Amen. And now, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord, to pray humbly, and to be a fine Christian example to all whom you meet, humble and pure, and begging for God's mercy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Alleluia and amen. <laughs>